is Summerween. This is Summerween, Summerween, Summerween. I feel like somebody's already done that, right? Hey y'all, welcome to my Summerween reading vlog. I'm super excited because I always think of August as the start of fall and fall leaves a spooky season, so naturally this is the perfect time to get super scared and read some cool horror books. Now for every readathon I've done so far, I've always tried to push myself and read at least five to seven books, and this time for the five book prompts I've chosen seven books, I'm really just testing myself every single week with these readathons. Let's go over my TBR really quick. The first prompt is to read a book with a creepy cover on it, and I've chosen The Whisper Man by Alex North. The next book prompt is to read a book with paranormal elements in it, and I have chosen Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. Uh, I don't think it's a spooky readathon without a Stephen King. Here is my obligatory pick. I've also chosen The Grown Up by Gillian Flynn as an audiobook option for this prompt. Next book prompt is to read a book with a haunted house in it, and I have chosen The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. The next book prompt is to read a book in the dark, and I have chosen to read My Lovely Wife by Samantha Downing uh, on ebook. And on audiobook, I've picked up The Wife Between Us by Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. And the last book prompt is to read a book recommended by one of the hosts, and I've chosen Gabby's recommendation of Bunny by Mona Awad. This is one of the books that has also been on my TBR for the longest time because I really enjoyed Mona Awad's uh, last book. So yeah, excited to check all these cool books out. Speaking of Bunny, I did start reading that last night. It's set at this really pretentious New England university and it follows Samantha who is completing her Master of Fine Arts program. She is half obsessed, half like in hatred of this group of writers uh, who call themselves bunnies or the bunny. They're like a weird cross between your preppy private school girls and like those groups of moms who like sip mimosa and have the little sweaters tied around their necks. I don't, I, they're hard to describe but Samantha gets an invitation one day to join the bunnies and it kind of leads her down this path of the weird quirks of female friendships. I've heard that this book is really trippy and like a kind of, there's a lot of like what is happening moments. Even just starting out reading the book, I can really feel the author's kind of signature cynical tone really set the mood for this character and this really weird group of friends who maybe they're normal but just because of how cynical the main narrator is you just feel like everything they do is very evil and sinister and there's ulterior motives everywhere i'm so excited to read more about what is up with these group of friends like what their deal is uh, i'll keep you all updated on when i get more into the book I'm back with an update a lot sooner than I expected, mainly because I picked up the Grown Up instead of Bunny. Uh, I was more in a audiobook mood while I was working on some edits for this video. The Grown Up follows this woman who's basically been trying to con her way through life, and while working as a psychic, she meets this woman named Susan. Susan has this problem with her house, her son, it seems very spooky, somewhat paranormal, and so the, our main character sees this as an opportunity to go and make a quick buck out of this poor woman's delusions. This book was originally part of George R. R. Martin's anthology and published as a short story separately. It has Gillian Flynn's kind of provocative style, very to the point, honest characters. I didn't really know where the plot was going. I assumed it to be paranormal based on the synopsis. As we were going, I thought it might lean towards true crime. And honestly, I'm really satisfied with the way it progressed because it had the potential to be really kind of cliche and like a want want like you have predicted it. But the way it ended and the kind of attitudes that the characters end up at were really refreshing and uh, made the story more unique than it could have been. 
I found myself really enjoying the story and I think the only thing is I wish it would have been a little bit more fleshed out to really carry that tension in the middle of the story but it's a it's a short story what are you gonna do i like starting out readathons by reading short stories it feels like you know i'm getting something done early on in the week and as i lose steam later on i become really grateful for the short stories that i start out with i'm gonna continue with bunny and try to find it on audiobooks so that i can get some other work done <music> Good morning friends, it is Tuesday and last night I finished reading Bunny by Mona Awad. The story was even more wacky than I originally thought it was. It just went in a direction that I completely didn't expect. There was one plot point that I caught on to pretty early in the story and I think is part of a bigger unspoken issue that the author is trying to present with the story regarding uh, mental well-being. Uh, the relationships that you foster with other people and how those can affect uh, your inner mental health. I would say the story falls pretty solidly in the magic realism spectrum. The weird parts of the story play into this bigger plot of our main character learning to accept the more darker, perhaps unsavory parts of her self, her character, her personality. Truly, I feel like I still haven't absorbed 100% of everything this book was trying to say just because it's really jammed packed like you have to read in between the lines every single word means something and it, like it slips by so fast so this probably needs a second read sometime soon but overall I really enjoyed this book Mona Awad's style is so caustic and kind of awesome in that way it's very refreshing so moving on to my next book, and I've decided I want to tackle one of the more intimidating books on my list. So I'm going to go for Pet Cemetery. I did find this on audiobook, thank goodness, so I can kind of switch between the different reading modes. I'm definitely more of a cat person, but this cat, Loki, makes me want to switch to being a dog person. Funny enough, the Pet Cemetery movie was one of my first real introductions into any of Stephen King's works. I watched The Shining before, but I didn't pay complete attention to it. Watching the Pet Cemetery movie was the start of me getting more into Stephen King's books. I've heard that the movie significantly differs from the book, and thank goodness too, because I really didn't enjoy the Pet Cemetery movie. I, even as like a story unto itself without knowing the book, I just felt like there were some quality issues, some plot development issues that hopefully didn't exist in the book. I don't know. I'm excited to check out the original and see what's up. Everyone says that this is one of the scariest Stephen King books and in the foreword Stephen King mentions that it's scary for him because it's so rooted in his reality, so that makes sense. Cool, so I'm gonna continue reading, but I actually have to run out in just a few minutes to uh, renew my driver's license. How fun. But uh, yeah, I'll keep y'all updated. Welcome back to this auspicious Wednesday. There's an SAT word for you. Uh, it's 6.30 p.m. and it's my first update of the day, so that'll tell you how today's been going. Last night I started reading Pet Cemetery, and it's been going swimmingly so far. I'm really into the story. We follow the Creeds, uh, specifically Lewis Creed. They just moved into this new house in Maine uh, for Lewis's job, and while the house isn't really that spooky. They find this very spooky pet cemetery that was made by children in the nearby town from like hundreds of years ago. Lewis starts getting really 
bad vibes, bad dreams surrounding the pet cemetery, and it seems like we're going to be spiraling from there, involving a lot of, you know, pets and possibly undead pets. I'm currently 155 pages into the book, uh, and I don't know what's taking me so long. I think um, the story is really good, but, you know, hard to get into the reading mood sometimes. You know how it is. Instead of reading, I've been really into this show called The Blacklist. It's this, like, criminal who is working with the FBI to clear through his blacklist, which is basically a list of other criminals that he doesn't think highly of. I don't know which one came first, but this reminds me a lot of White Collar, and I really loved White Collar, and so I really liked Blacklist. It's a really interesting show so far. If y'all like, you know, the kind of FBI crime shows, it's pretty good. I'm going to continue to read this and try to get through more of it, and probably start The Wife Between Us as the book to read in the dark. So I'll be listening to that tonight. Hello, it's Thursday morning, and I've gotten to part two, yes, part two, the Micmac Burying Ground in Pet Cemetery. Um, so far, it's not as scary as I thought it would be, and that's something that I've heard from a lot of people who, uh, when they first read Pet Cemetery, they're like, eh, like, the two-thirds mark isn't, like, super frightening, it's just kind of, like, meh. Um, and I think it also kind of dulls with the fact that I have somewhat of an idea of what's going on based on the movie, so I'm like prepared for some of the things that happen. Um, but so far, it's got more depth than the movie does, certainly. It goes a lot more into the lore and the history surrounding Pet Cemetery, and that was something that I really missed from the movie because uh, the movie kind of treated it like it is what it is. While here we get some of the more spiritual, magical kind of elements that surround this cemetery itself. So far the most unsettling part of this book for me, I think, is actually Ellie. She's just such a weird kid. I don't know, maybe it's because I haven't interacted with kids in a while, but the way she talks and the like attitude she has is very creepy. She's just kind of a creepy kid to me. On a ranking of creepiness, I think that Ellie ranks higher than church for me, and uh, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be church right here. <laughs> I have high hopes that I'm going to be able to finish this book today and start on a new one. Hopefully it gets a little bit creepier. Maybe it just like packs a punch in the end. I mean, obviously we're going to get some more undead, dead kind of creepiness. Um, I think overall zombies have never been, or like the undead have never been the most scary kind of horror element to me. It's a trope that kind of just amuses me at best, so maybe that's why I'm not quite as scared, but yeah. Excited to finish this and start on my next book. We've reached the end of Pet Cemetery, and the majority of my thoughts throughout the last 50% of the book was kind of just tired. I was just getting real tired of Lewis's BS, and at this point I just wanted the story to be over. <laughs> I'm making quite a few comparisons to the movie just because that was my initial frame of reference for this book. Uh, the movie differs in a lot of ways. From the book, uh, but it is quite similar in the key plot points at least. The last half of the book really dives into the kind of evolving mental state of Lewis as these really big plot points happen. It shows more clearly the influences on his mind and the deterioration of his mental state, and also the external influences that are shaping and changing his future. I also figured out that the reason why Ellie really disturbed me was that she is a little bit too sharp for a kid. She's just 
knows a little bit too much and that comes up a little bit later in the book but as I was reading I was like ah that's why she gives me the heebie-jeebies because kids who know a lot like know more than they should kind of is one of the scarier tropes to me. I think for about 95% of the book I was absolutely fine not at all scary or creepy but then for the last 5% I legitimately was scared to read on. I think if I had read it in the dark, I would not have made it through, but most of this book was pretty okay. This is the third Stephen King book that I've finished, and it's not quite one of my favorites, but uh, much better than the movie, still worth checking out. So I want to stick to the rules, and I'll wait until it's a little more dark outside to start listening to The Wife Between Us, but for now, I'm going to start The Whisper Man by Alex North. The supernatural premise of this book has always really kind of creeped me out, so I'm glad I didn't choose this book for the one to read in the dark, uh, but I'll get started on that and see how it goes. It's already Sunday, so it's the last day of Summerween. I've been a little bit slacking on the vlogging part, but I finally managed to finish both The Wife Between Us as well as The Whisper Man. The Wife Between Us follows our two main characters, Nellie and Vanessa. Nellie is in the process of getting married to her fiance, Richard, while Vanessa is lamenting her past marriage to Richard. It's a suspense thriller that follows both points of views as they eventually converge. So from what I've seen, a lot of people tend to not like this book because it's very predictable. There are several major plot twists that people can immediately see through, and I can kind of see where that's coming from, where if you're really into a book for the surprise element, especially if it's more on the mystery side, it can seem kind of boring if you immediately see through the story. For me, I didn't necessarily guess all the plot twists, which made the read kind of interesting. There's so much foreshadowing in it, builds the tension up to a certain point where you just you're tired of it at some point. There were several points where I was definitely kind of half listening to the audiobook just so that I could finally get to the big reveals. I do think overall some of the plot twists, while very convenient, weren't necessarily bad. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it very clearly, but it was almost comical in some places to me, just not the plot twists themselves like what they actually were but like just the fact that they kept coming like one after another just felt unreal. There are pretty graphic instances of domestic violence so if that's something that is not your thing skip this one and if you don't want to be spoiled for this book skip this next part. The use of domestic violence as the plot twist was something that I did kind of predict because it was so heavily implied throughout the book. It's something that I know not a lot of people like because it feels like one of those instances where a plot twist is kind of a cop-out. You're just like, oh, and in the end, he was a terrible human. So um, maybe that's why it kind of feels predictable to a lot of people when they're reading it. Overall, I did enjoy seeing the plot kind of come together and seeing where all the pieces fit but I was quite bored and uninvested in the characters throughout the majority of the book, and if I didn't have the audiobook, I think it would have been much harder to get through. The writing style for me was fine. I know a lot of people mentioned it's a little bit difficult knowing when we're in the past and when we're in the present. I did find a lot of Vanessa's parts in the first half of the book to be quite irritating just because it just was so monotonous. It was always like, I did this, then I did this, I did this. It was like the exact same structure, which felt quite 
just boring and I think that added to the slowness of the story at the start. Overall I give this book three stars and I have heard that if you feel kind of meh about one of Greer Hendricks and Sarah Peckenden's books that you would like the other one so I want to check out the other one and see if I like that one more since I was kind of eh about this one. And the next book I finished was The Whisper Man. It follows Tom Kennedy who just moved into this new house with his son Jake. They're kind of looking to start a new life. In this new town there's been a recent disappearance of a boy that closely resembles a series of serial killings 20 years ago, all committed by someone the media nicknamed The Whisper Man. After Tom and Jake move into this new house, Jake starts hearing whispers and very unsettling things throughout the night. This was a suspense thriller that was more on the true crime side with a tinge of supernatural. I definitely liked it more than I thought it would. It gave me the chills in several places. Just the descriptions of whispering throughout the night made me want to lock all my doors, check them twice, close all my windows, and install a whole brand new security system. I enjoyed the pacing of this book overall and I think the only thing that would have improved it for me was if near the end we had a little bit longer time in the attic. If y'all read the book you know what I mean. If we had spent a little bit more time in the attic and really built up that tension I think that would have really like, like made it perfect. The switching point of views in the beginning was actually pretty interesting because I really dreaded reading the points of views with Jake and Tom because those are the ones that always creep me out the most. The true crime aspect doesn't scare me as much but uh, it was really nice having those kind of little slices of the police work in there because it made it less scary for me and it kind of cut the tension a little bit so it made the book less terrifying to get through. I was really on the edge of my seat for the last quarter of the book. It was really really tense and the last kind of ending managed to tie up the book in a way that was kind of like surprisingly satisfying. I don't know. I hope that there's nothing that continues on from this book like in the same story. This is just this is perfect where it is. We don't need to go any further. Seeing as it's Sunday and we really only have a few more hours left of Summerween, I want to try to power through the last two books I have, especially since they're not too long. The first book is The Haunting of Hill House and the next book is My Lovely Wife. So I'm going to try to power through both of those today and see where we get. Happy Monday y'all! It's the end of Summerween and last night I finished The Haunting of Hill House. In this book we follow our four main characters. First is Dr. Montague who is an anthropologist very interested in the paranormal and he's the one that sets up this observational experiment at Hill House. Then we have Eleanor who is a young woman who's very unhappy with her life and had been taking care of her ailing mother for most of her life until she passed away. Then we have Theodora who is this very free-spirited psychic artist who has a lot of experience with the paranormal. And then lastly we have Luke who is the next in line owner for the Hill House. This book was interesting in that it delved more into the psychology of what makes the horror genre so scary rather than just showing it within the book. It was pretty meta in a lot of ways because the characters seemed so unconcerned with a lot of the creepy things that were happening. In fact, they were quite thrilled that they were seeing all these really scary paranormal things happening. And really this book confronts the thin line sometimes between the supernatural horror and the psychological horror because in a lot of instances where we have unreliable narrators or unreliable perspectives, the supernatural horror can be very easily confused with the influences that their mind is projecting onto their surrounding. If you're a fan of modern horror, the kind that really like is supposed to get you scared, I don't think this one is for you. If you're more into the gothic, unsettling, psychological side of horror, this one might be one to check out. Personally, when I was reading through it, I didn't get the point until about halfway through. 
Uh, and then reading it from a different perspective helped a lot in understanding the story. It has the feel of, dare I say, literary fiction horror? Can that be a genre? It feels a lot like that. In any case, I ended up giving The Haunting of Hill House four stars. So that wraps up our week of reading for Summer Ween. This has been really fun. I've gotten to a lot of the thrillers, horrors, mysteries that I haven't been able to uh, in the past year, so I'm really glad to have gotten to some of those and found some really good books. If y'all also participated in Summerween, let me know. What were some of your favorite books, scariest books? Did you see anything supernatural or spooky during the week? Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please click like. And if you want to see more, click subscribe. And I'll see you all next time. <laughs>